us pray. We beseech thee, O Lord, pour thy grace into our hearts, that as we have known the incarnation of thy Son, Jesus Christ, by the message of an angel, so by his cross and passion we may be brought unto the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're doing, I'm doing somewhat of a series here, Orthodox answers to non-orthodox questions and I think there are two ways to look at the word non-orthodox people out there who don't know who we are and we ourselves who often don't know who we are uh, we, we actually define ourselves unfortunately or we tend to define ourselves by the way, Amer way American society defines us and that's incorrect so some of the things I want to address in these classes are some of the things that that are true of us and that we need to see about ourselves. So the answer here is not only for the world around us and help us to answer to the world when they ask these questions like what on earth is the Orthodox Church, but also when we ask that question, we can, we can know what it's all about. I don't know how things have changed, but I know that 30 years ago, people in this part of the country did not know who the, orth who the Orthodox were. And I think it's because we were not very prevalent in the middle of the country and in the South. Um, you know, our diocese, the Diocese of Wichita in mid-America, and the Vicariate's another thing altogether, but uh, so we're in two dioceses. We're in the Vicariate and we're in the Diocese of Wichita in mid-America. Uh, and in that diocese, that diocese stretches from the Canadian to Mexican borders, from the Rocky Mountains to the Mississippi River. And that was the last area in America that in which Orthodoxy was brought. So we're not everywhere like we are in, in, in Alaska. Nearly every church in Alaska is Orthodox. Uh, the native people are Orthodox. Everybody's Orthodox up there. In the Northeast, we're all over the place. And they came, people, immigrants from Europe and, and North Africa and the like came across the, the Atlantic and settled in the Northeast and they came in the country in their major port cities and then moved from there down the coast across the Midwest. So you see us all over the place in Ohio, uh, in, in, Indianapolis, in Indiana, in Illinois. Uh, so up there, if you, that question doesn't get asked. They know who we are. I remember when I was ordained to the diaconate in the Orthodox Church. This was in Cleveland. Uh, there was a Ukrainian, it was an Antiochian church, but right down the street, a block away, was a Ukrainian church. Two blocks beyond that was a Greek church, and about four blocks to the other direction was a Russian church. We're everywhere. Everybody knows who we are, uh, but not in this part of the country, at least not long ago. That's changing uh, because of the missionary work of a number of people and the fact that just more Americans are moving away from those other areas toward this open country. So we're becoming more prevalent. In the light of the fact that people haven't heard of us, the question was frequently asked, and I, maybe you all have experienced this, maybe you haven't, but I thought Orthodox was Jewish. So, is that what you said? <laughs> so, I had, a, I had a parishioner who, who told people she was Orthodox, and they just assumed she meant Jewish, until they went out to dinner one night, and she took them all out, and she ordered bacon or pork or some <laughs> such thing. And they were astounded, and you know, or, among Orthodox, Orthodox Jews, you, you keep kosher. Uh, and so they just assumed that, and they were astounded, and they said, you can't do that. And she said, why not? And they said, because you're Jewish. She said, I'm not Jewish. So then she had to explain. Well, it eased their minds. She knew she wasn't violating the kosher laws. Another mistake that people have made in the past, and maybe you still experience this, is that they think we are a denomination of Christianity. I've been asked the question, from whom did you break off? We didn't break off from anybody, folks. I hate to tell you. So what I'm going to give you are some basic facts that I want you to t put in your minds. And, and, and let me just add something here. This will seem like this has nothing to do with the spiritual life, but I assure you, everything in orthodoxy has something to do with the spiritual life. Everything. That's what's so cool about it. It's all pertinent. So we can't dismiss anything as being irrelevant, except dismissing it as being irrelevant. So in any case, the Orthodox Church, believe it or not, is the second largest Christian body in the world. Boy, they'd not believe that around this part of the country. The second largest behind the Roman Catholic Church. The numbers for how many people we have vary, so I, I don't know which is valid or what is valid. 
uh, this, it, anywhere from 150 to 300 million adherents. I remember before the Soviet Union collapsed that a lot of American Christians used to assume, assume because of communism in Russia that there were no Christians left in Russia. So when the Soviet Union system collapsed in, what, 1989, there were a horde of Protestant missionaries who went over to Russia to bring the gospel to these godless people. Did you know that the two largest Orthodox bodies in the United States are Russia and Romania, two of the countries of the Soviet bloc? That tells you how much Christianity was suppressed by the communists. It didn't work. If anything, it brought them deeper, many of them. So we're the second largest Christian body in the world. When we all converted, we locked on to a huge, huge ship. We didn't even know it. For the first thousand years of Christian history, for the first thousand years, we were one with the Catholic Church. But there was a division, and the years usually given for this is 1054. Actually, I would say that 1204 is a better year, but I don't waste time talking about that. That's another lesson. So the year we usually give is 1054. There was a division, and it was over several matters, but two of them were, one was, two of them were this, the, the, the authority of the Roman patriarch or the pope and also the insertion of the filioque clause in the Nicene Creed, filioque being Latin for and the Son. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. That was a problem. Now let me step back and talk about both of those. First of all, the reason why it was a problem in the church was that there weren't one but five popes in those days. Most people don't know this, including us. Five each with the kind of jurisdiction we understand more or less the papacy to have, but limited to their own space. And all of a sudden, one of them says, I'm the boss over all of you. And the other said, it's never been that way before. We're not going to buy that. So there was a division. Now, there, what happened was really a struggle between patriarchs. And if you think that's anything new, you've experienced it and didn't even know it. Uh, when years ago, maybe even a couple of centuries back, the Russians subjugated the Church of Ukraine into the Soviets, into the Patriarchate of Moscow. So all those churches were under the Patriarchate of Moscow. When the, when the Soviet Union collapsed and, they, and Ukraine gained its independence, there was a group of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church who who said, we, we don't want to be under the Patriarch of Moscow. So they appealed to the Patriarch of Constantinople uh, to take them under wing, which he agreed to do. And so there was a struggle between the Patriarch of Moscow and the Patriarch of Constantinople over these people. Uh, and it was a struggle primarily between hierarchs who, who stopped praying for each other. And all the other churches in Orthodoxy aligned themselves with one side or the other. Did you know that? We're all still in communion with one another, and we're all still seeing each other, and we're all in the same church, you see? That's what happened in 1054. Nobody thought anything of this except the patriarchs at a grassroots level. In fact, 100 years later, or 50 years later, when, when, the, when the people in the Middle East, the Orthodox Christians in the Middle East, wanted someone to come help them get rid of the, the, the Muslims who were taking over the Christian shrines, and they called on the West to help. Send help. Why? Because they didn't see themselves as really being divided. It was a struggle between patriarchs. And we have lived something like that. So if we want to know why and how that can happen, that's how it happened. Well, the filioque clause in the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son was implemented in the, the original creed didn't have that. It said the one we use. The Father, Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father because that's what Christ said. And that's what the church said in 325 or 381 at the second uh, council when they completed the Nicene Creed. Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Now, the concept of the Son <coughs> clause was first in, used or created 
somewhere between the seventh and eighth centuries in Spain by Orthodox Christians who were, who were being assaulted by Goths coming in through France. And the Goths were notoriously Aryan. That is, they believed that the sun was not eternal in the Godhead. So, so the church in Spain arbitrarily inserted this phrase in the creed to show that the origin of the sun was eternal. It was not intended to be anything intentional. They were not trying to change the creed. And yet, it became so popular that everybody else in Europe took over and began to use it. And here's one of the interesting notes. The papacy of Rome was the last church in Europe to accept the filioque. Isn't that ironic? And yet, a couple hundred years later, they were trying to impose it on the East. And the Orthodox people just said, hey, we've never done that before. We're not going to start doing it now. That's Orthodoxy. I, I, I can't resist, but there were two other, there were some petty arguments that went on. And one of them was that in the West, and I love to pick on you in this regard, but in the West, uh, the clergy tended to be clean-shaven in the East with beards. And so the East was saying, you guys can't be real Christians. You don't have beards. <laughs> so I like to tell him he's not a real priest because he doesn't have a beard. And, of course, what they said, beards in those days, they meant went down here. So that really rules me out, too. So just thought you should know when we start nitpicking about things like this, we've got to be really, really careful. Now, the other issue was unleavened bread versus leavened bread. We do, and in spite of what anyone says to you in the Western Rite, we use leavened bread in the Mass. So don't let anybody tell you, you people got it all wrong. You're using unleavened bread like the Roman Catholics. Wrong. We use leavened bread. Period. That's one of the requirements of coming into the Western Rite Vicariate. You got to get that straight. So just thought I'd tell you that. FYI even if it's only just lightly sprinkled on. We are the oldest because of the fact that we, we, we refused to change when Rome tried to impose a different concept or some different concepts on us. That renders us the oldest Christian body in the world. The oldest Christian body. And I use the word body. I'm going to come back to it as to show you why. But we're the oldest there are two things that define the church, two concepts. One is the institution. We have an institution here, this group, this building, this place. And we're part of a larger institution, the Western Rite Vicariate, which is a part of a larger institution, the Antiochian Archdiocese of North America, which is part of a larger arch institution, which is the Antiochian Patriarchate, which is part of a larger institution, which is the Orthodox Church going all the way back. So the institution, and, and that's, I got a lesson coming up called, we don't be, believe in, in, or why don't you believe in the Bible or as an authority or some such thing? I can't remember what it is. It's against the concept of, is it biblical? Uh, so we don't ask that question in orthodoxy. It doesn't mean we don't believe it. We just don't ask it. Uh, and so in any case, the, the institution goes back to the church in Rome, the church in Ephesus, the church in Colossae. And by the way, the church, Galatia was not a town. Galatia was an area. So the, church, the epistle to the Galatians is an epistle to all the churches in the province or area of Galatia. I might add that Galatia was from the old Celtic word for Gaulish. Uh, they were Celts. <laughs> My people. <laughs> Your people. <laughs> so. We warranted a, a, an epistle. So, uh, in any case, the institution and the doctrinal package, all the doctrines. For example, what do you say about God? Anyone, any church who says they don't have a doctrine is not telling the truth. Ask them, what do you believe about God? No matter what they tell you, that's a doctrine. Remember, doctrine comes from the Latin word doctrina, which comes from the Greek word didaskalia, which means teaching. What do we teach? If we even say God exists, we have a doctrine of God. Because sooner or later we have to define what, what does God mean? What does that word mean? 
So we have a doctrinal package, God, Revelation. What is Revelation? I don't mean the book of Revelation. I mean just God revealing himself. Christology, who is Jesus? Mariology, even if somebody says, we don't believe anything about Mary, we don't talk about Mary, that's a Mariology. Ecclesiology, the definition of the church. If somebody says, we don't have bishops, <laughs> there's your ecclesiology. Sacramental theology, is there, are there seven sacraments? Are there two sacraments? Are there no sacraments? Anthropology, what do we say about humanity? Well, if we say well, there's salvation in Christ, why? Do we need something? Yes. And that's an anthropo anthropological statement. Soteriology, what is Christ? who is Christ? What does he do? He saves us. From what? That's soteriology. Eschatology, the end times. I'm going to talk about we don't believe in the rapture in the Orthodox Church because that belief was never heard of until about 1820. It's a new doctrine. It's not the doctrine of the ancient church. We'll look at that another time. Anyway, so eschatology really plays a part. And you don't know how many, maybe you do, how many bodies and churches in North America uh, who believe that the rapture is biblical and the doctrine of Christianity about the end times. It isn't. Anyway, the definition of church is both of those, both of those, and I'm going, to, I'm going to allude to it in a future lesson. Take both of those and think of any church you see, any church you see, and do what I call the backward test. So take those, keeping those two things in mind, so you really have to go on their websites, or maybe, maybe is it Facebook now, or what is it? I don't know. I, I, they were websites to me. That was Whatever new. I say today will change tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know. I'm an old guy. I don't know what those <laughs> things mean anymore. I don't even know how to work a computer, hardly. So it, in any case, we used to go on websites, and what I found was they would make them look very nice, and yet they're, in most cases, the doctrines were buried in the website. You had to really dig to find out what they believed because in America it's not popular to say something that might offend somebody. And doctrine tends to offend. But if you can find out what these various operations believe, go back to 2000. To the year 2000. You can somehow do this. Sometimes if you just read about these people, you can figure this out. When you go back to 2000, based upon this, a lot of the churches now, they just in any form or fashion. Go back to 1950, more drop out. Go back to 1900, you lose the Pentecostal and Assembly of God churches because of the Pentecostal movement between, around 1904. This is just in America. I'm not talking about Europe. I don't know about Europe. I'm just talking about the United States. Go back to 1840. There was a revival of Christianity and uh, Protestant revival in the 1840s in which were born the Campbellite churches, that is the Disciples of Christ, the Churches of Christ, and a few others that are related to them. Go back to 1700. You might probably get rid of the Methodist movement back when it was a revival movement in Anglicanism rather than a denomination. Go back to 1500, all you have left are the Orthodox and the Catholics. Go back to 1054 or 1204, if you will, and there's only us. That is, if you look for the institution and the doctrinal package being unchanged. So, we are the original church. We are the church. This is why I don't like to use the word churches for everybody else out there, because they're not. And let me, if you say that's, that's arrogant. Well, it's only arrogant if we're wrong. And the burden of proof lies with everybody else. And let me just say this. If you read Acts 19, 1 to 7, go, if you don't have your Bibles with you, go home and read it. I don't have mine with me. I'm just going to tell you what it says. St. Paul is traveling around Asia Minor, and he comes to Ephesus, and he wrote an epistle to Ephesus later. 
But he comes to Ephesus and he finds a group of people who are described as disciples. Christians, right? Well, yeah, more or less. He calls them disciples. St. Luke calls them disciples. They knew enough about Jesus to be considered Christians, but they were deficient in some areas. Now, in America, we'd say, oh, that's okay. They believe in Jesus. That's all we need to know. We're, 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 we're the church. They didn't even know the Holy Spirit, and they had not been baptized correctly, according to that text. And the church did not leave them there. It told them what the right things were and made them do it. So they were all rebaptized, and they began to believe about the Holy Spirit. The deficiencies were corrected, and they became a part of the church, the institution. They were still Christians, so all the people out there are Christians. They're just outside the church. Because orthodoxy is the church. We have all been outside the church. Now, all, most of us who are converts, it was those places that got us here. So God can work anywhere he wants to. But that doesn't mean we stay out there. And it doesn't mean the definition of the church changes just because of this scenario. Let me give you, let me give you a, a, let's make one up here. Let's say that I decide that I don't like the way he runs the show. So I get a bunch of you to agree with me. And we break off and start our own operation two blocks away. But we call ourselves, we start calling St. Peter's Orthodox Church both congregations together. That's what Americans do. Every time somebody gets upset, he breaks off and starts his own congregation, and the definition of the church broadens. That is not the way of the ancient church. There's one church, and everybody else who breaks off is outside of it. When I began to look at orthodoxy as a, as a way to respond to what was going on in terms of the morals and values of the church in which I was a part. <clears throat> Excuse me. When, when I began to do that, I saw only two options going back that were uniting because Christ said, may they all be one as we are one. The modern popular, American popular view is uh, the way we do that is that if we all just take communion together, our doctrines will begin to coincide or doctrines don't matter. So that's a man-made thing. Wrong. So in any case, <clears throat> oh, by the way, I would just add here that <laughs> this, this is, history and reality are often, are seldom what we think they are, <clears throat> at least in the United States. When Martin Luther died, those who followed him in the Lutheran movement in Germany <clears throat> realized or recognized that the Orthodox were the original church, and so they began to do over, well, some of their bishops began to make literary overtures to the Patriarch of Constantinople about being reunited with the original church. Well, as it turned out, they weren't communicating, and it never happened, it just fizzled out. Half a century later, some bishops in England called non-jurors also recognized that the Orthodox Church was the original church. And they made overtures to be reunited. And here's the thing. They would have been reunited to the Eastern Rite. That was not a problem for those people. The Marian Doctrine was. And so that fizzled out too. But what I'm, my point here is that both of those groups saw themselves or saw Orthodoxy as being the church. And that was in the 15 late 1500s, early 1600s. So it's not wrong for us to see that. By the way, when I was growing up, the Presbyterians and Lutherans, and I don't know about the Methodists, but the Presbyterians and Lutherans at least saw themselves as the, the church. Closed communion was normal for everybody in those days. You didn't go to a church and think, oh, open communion. I can take communion because I'm a Christian. It, it didn't work that way. And nobody thought anything of it. In any case, we are not a denomination. And so you read some Orthodox sources say we're pre-denominational. That's what that means. And what I like to say is we didn't denominate from anybody. <laughs> I want you to remember that. And it doesn't mean it doesn't mean be arrogant. It means more is expected of us, so we better get that right. More is expected of us. There's no excuse for piddling around here. We're in the real church now. There is nowhere else to go except down.
I think what I was going to tell you is that I saw Roman Orthodoxy is the only way we could reunite. So you don't combat sin by committing another sin, dividing the body of Christ, or at least what one understands to be the body of Christ, the church. If the church is all of those, every time somebody breaks off, he divides it. Well, Christ said, let them be one. So it's trying to combat a sin by committing another sin. That doesn't work. <laughs> The only two things we can do, go to Rome, because at least it's a step backward for, back toward the beginning for most of us, or go to Orthodoxy, because it's all the way. So in any case, I would say one way to explain to people is that we're similar in appearance to the Catholic Church. Most people have at least a vague idea of what that means. So it gives them a vision, at least they can say, oh, well, I sort of see that. Uh, I don't know what they know, probably not much. We, we are different, but i, I got to add, the distinctions are subtle, but impaired, a bit important. Everything is slightly different. Yes, sir? I have a question. <clears throat> I had a real misunderstanding of what institutions meant. Mm -hmm. Because I thought that the Catholic Church was an institution that was in Rome. I thought it meant that Christ instituted the Holy the Eucharist. Well, that too. That too. Yeah, I mean, you you said it was an institution. Yes. That big, smart part of the well, bigger part of it. But I thought it only meant about the Eucharist. I didn't understand. Yeah, that, that when in the words in the Mass itself, the words that the, the action of Christ on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and took the cup. That's called the institution. That's what I that's called the institution. But that's a part that's of, since what he, he gave us, that's a part of the work of the institution. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Another thing about the Orthodox Church is, and I, and I know you know this and you love it, the Orthodox Church doesn't change. Now, having said that, please understand the word definition of the word change. It all depends on how you word that. Uh, and I was thinking about this in the sermon. There was something I can't remember now what I was trying to remember so I could tell you because it was so important. I'll probably wake up in the middle of the night and lose sleep over it, you know. Call me so, when you wake up. Yeah, I'll call you when I wake up. <laughs> I'm sure your wife would love that. <laughs> in any case, within the Mass, the, the first, first Masses that were done in the first century were fairly simple and short. I mean, to give you an example, they may have started, look at the Good Friday liturgy, the, the, liturgy, the first part of the liturgy. Some scholars believe that, that was the original format for the liturgy of the word. Uh, in any case, what has happened is the very basic structure of the liturgy is there unchanged. Whenever anything gets added, it gets added at the beginning or the end. <laughs> and eventually they get assimilated into the liturgy. So technically you'd argue the liturgy has changed. Well, it hasn't changed. So it depends on how you define the word. Uh, in the Western Rite, the last gospel was originally not there. So it was the prayer of a priest who came up with the idea. He started praying that on his way out. And his bishop found out about it and said, this is a great idea. Everybody should do it. And so it went from his parish to his diocese. And even today, in the Western Rite, the two, it started out as a private prayer, and then it began to be corporate. As people found out about it, they wanted to read it with them because it's so powerful. So... It really is both ways. If you had gone to Father Dan Keller's parish or Lady of Walsingham when he was there, he did it quietly. And we do it aloud. I prefer it aloud. I think it, it sums up the liturgy in such a profound way. So you could argue, yeah, you guys have changed the liturgy. Not really. And here's the thing about change. We don't let the society around us tell us we change. Who cares what society does? That's part of being orthodox. We give that up. And so when, when our society says you should have rock and roll bands up at the front playing contemporary music because you want to appeal to the young people and to everybody else, we just say, we don't do that. You don't have to come here. We don't do that. We do ancient music. Old, old music. 
By the way, the lyrics of that first communion hymn were from the monastery in Bangor County Down, and I took great pride and told my wife that County Down was the county of my father's family. <laughs> so I was proud of the words. So, and then we ended on Be Thou My Vision, which is also an Irish hymn, so hey, it's, it's, it's Patty Day. <laughs> Lastly, the use of the word orthodox. Orthodoxia. You know, we recognize doxia as, as glory. Doxology. Think of doxologies. The, the summation at the end of a prayer or something. Ortho, the right way. Orthodontics. It means correct or straight worship or glory. The word was first used, I, I've done li, li, some examination of this from the literary sources, and so I don't know how reliable this is, but the first Christian usage literarily from, of the word it appears to be from St. Hegesippus in the second century. The first Jewish usage in literary material that I can find is 1807. So whose word is it? It's ours. It's us. It's a Christian word. Orthodox is a Christian word. So in simple answer to the question, who are those people? Or you can say, I'm a member of the Orthodox Church. What? Simple, four simple points to remember, and this is what you tell people. We're the second largest Christian body in the world. That makes, turns it on them. <laughs> they have to go find out, how's this? how did I miss this all my days? Secondly, for the first thousand years of Christian history, we were one with the Catholic Church. So that gives them a vision of sort of what we're like and also how long we've been around. A division occurred in 1054 over the authority of the Pope. There were five popes in those days. That's news to most people, probably including us, I don't know. And, and lastly, similar to the Catholic Church, but with subtle distinctions. So that gives them a sort of an image, as I've said, of what to look for. Some answers for ourselves. Remember what I said to you. We didn't break off from anybody. We've always been here. You can depend on this church to be right and to come through. It's always been here. It is the church, and you're in it. Wow. Me? Ma? We don't change, or the church doesn't change. We change. We come to the church and we change. We need to get that straight. You know, in America, we want wherever we're going to change for us so that we don't have to change, so that we can settle in somewhere for as long as we want. And I can tell you that whenever you concede to things like that, they don't stay around very long. They move on to the next new thing. Because we're all like that. We change. And orthodoxy believes it's, it receives its belief from God's self-revelation. So this is the last point. Let me see if I can do this. About, where's the book? We receive, revela we receive the truth from God's, God reveals himself there is a variation of this where we then having him having revealed himself we take the revelation and then we build intellectually upon whatever subject matter we're studying, comparing it to the revelation. Measuring it by that. Both of those happened in the church. However, over the course of time, orthodoxy has focused more on this and Rome on this. And the problem with this model is too, too often, this gets so much attention that this gets left out or this begins to be seen as changing. The revelation of God does not change. 
It may deepen for our sakes, but it does not change. So the revelation's always going to be the same. And yeah, we do, we do compare our, our, our knowledge and the like to, to what's been revealed. Uh, but only to find out if we need to change our understanding. And as many of you have learned, you come into orthodoxy and it's, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And we're going, what's happening here? And just when we think we've arrived and we've figured it all out, we get taken a few steps further. And they aren't, and they aren't where we think they're going to be. That's the way revelation of God is. And lastly, the world sees this. Build intellectually, compare, build intellectually, take this out, and maybe you might arrive at some notion of God. Maybe. Maybe not. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Only what can be proven and verified matters. So that's the problem with the Roman position is that it's too close to this. If we drop the revelation or fail to use it, we fall into the world's model. And I think that's what's happened to a Christian... Christian bodies in America, as they've, they've tended to do that, at least the main lines, and others are breaking off in response to it and starting their own parishes and their own operations in, in response to it. They need to come back to orthodoxy. Remember when, when the people under Father Peter Gilquist came in, Metropolitan Phillips said, welcome home. Uh, and many of us didn't get that. Welcome home. Anyway. The next time I'm going to talk about why do we have a different Bible? Yes, sir. Um, my question I've always had, you, you went to the history of kind of the word orthodoxy. When did the church start using the word orthodox church? Because there's, in 1000 AD, before the split, they called themselves the church or the Catholic church or whatever the, the word was, and then they split. You have the Roman Catholic Church, and then everybody in the East started calling themselves. Well, the church had always did they the undivided church had always called itself Orthodox and Catholic, and you'll find both those words in our doctrinal statements. Oh, okay. And and we started using the word Orthodox to define our faith in the mid mid to late second century because there were people who were calling themselves Christians who were rising and espousing things which the church had not received. And they called that heterodox, right. other than uh, and other than the correct glory. So okay. when their split occurred in 1054, more or less over the course of time, uh, the Orthodox continued to use that word for themselves, and the West continued to call them, use the word Catholic for themselves. One faith for all people is what Catholic means. So both sides use words to define themselves. But again, using the, the backward test and understanding the two aspects of, of, of what constitutes the church. We still, use them. we still use the same language, both Catholic and yeah. Orthodox, yeah. in our prayer life. In our I, I, know, yeah. I know some of us in the East side used to say, we're the big C, we're the little C. Yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah, we're going to look at big T and little T as well. <laughs> uh, it, it, that has its own issues. So, uh, yeah. anyway. All right, thank you for that. I saw your hand up first. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. So, on the board, you wrote, take Revelation and then build intellectually. How is that done? Are there classes or, you know, it could be through classes, reading, whatever, just accumulating information, however you do that. It all depends on each one of us. Um, the scholastic period, for example, in the West, the scholastic scholars were trying to find definitions, for example, the existence of God, the purpose of the universe, and all the, how everything how everything worked out, and putting it logically. It was more of a philosophical approach to reality than anything else. And they used the faith, they, they, they compared the faith, they took it, they used the faith to measure it, so that, you know, if, if, it, if, it's, if they arrived at some conclusion that said man was okay and didn't need salvation, they knew, well, that's wrong. So that will eliminate that one as a possibility. Okay. So we do do that in the church. Okay. And then my other question, I'm not sure I can explain this where it makes sense. So going back to the filial play, or mm -hmm. however you say it, um, the Anglican Church, 
No, well, no, Not that, was before, that, was, creed, that was before the division of the church, and it wasn't, it wasn't the Roman Catholic Church which came up, it was the undivided church which came up with that creed. We still use it in, in the Western mm -hmm. Rite on Trinity Sunday, or we can, we don't have to, we can. Uh, Eastern Rite doesn't use it, uh, just like it doesn't use for, for all practical purposes the Apostles' Creed either, doesn't it? So the, the, the Nicene is considered as sufficient for usage in the services. So uh, it's not a heretical doctrine. It's actually very useful, but it's not, one, it's not the original format. The original format was the Apostles' Creed. We used for baptisms. And then that format was used when the Nicene Council and the Constantinopolitan Council, the first one in 381, met. And, and fleshed out what we have as the Nicene Creed. They use the Apostles' Creed, the Baptismal Creed, to flesh it out and to make more of a statement, a more definitive statement. We've never added to that, added to that in terms of the creed. We understand it much more deeply now. But so the Western Rite Orthodox does believe in the Athanasian Creed? We, yeah, we can use it, yeah. It, it, all of Orthodoxy believes in it, just they don't just don't use it in the Eastern Rite. It that's doesn't a, have a filioque. In. No, it doesn't. No, no. That, and that's the point he's making. The creed, the Athanasian creed, creed, doesn't have the filioque, saying that the Holy Spirit processes from Jesus. Right. That and that was yeah. what he was talking about with the creed and the development of the creed. Hang on, just a minute. So, somebody over here had a question before me, sir. Um, when you talk about the, the liturgy as uh, unchanged fundamentally, uh, how are we supposed to see the um, like the reforms that came out of the Second Vatican Council to the Roman Council, uh, the Roman Catholics? Does that constitute a, like a fundamental change to the liturgical practices? Yes. Yeah, it's called in the West Rite. It's called Novus Ordo, the new calendar. Uh, and the Western Rite Vicariate frowns on us doing Novus Ordo practice. <laughs> like, all right, all right, you're first, you're next. <laughs> I saw the term, uh, the Greek Orthodox Catholic Church of Antioch. So what they were doing that. that the, remember, going back to in the first thousand years, the church, the Roman Empire, the church was based upon the, the, the administrative ge geography of the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, the eastern part of the empire, the language of practice and, and, and commerce and everything else was Greek. In the west, it was Latin. So if you take a mark from Albania and just cut right down and go through North Africa, that's east, Greek east, Latin west. Church grew up with that. So starting in around the third century, the church, as more and more upper class people came into the church in the west, they started using Latin instead of Greek. The early church used all Greek. So when, when, the, when the churches developed in the eastern part of the empire, they called themselves the Greek Orthodox Church of Antioch in all the east. So that's what we're called, even though we're Western right and we're Latin or That's what I, I love to see the look on people. It's not stating the patriarchate, in other words. Yeah. It's not, and it's not stating an ethnic background. No, no, it just has to do with, we originate from the Greek-speaking expression of the Christian faith. It's Greek Orthodox Catholic. Oh, well, it, it could, that could, I don't have to see it where it, well, I'd have to see it and who it belongs to. It could be the Byzantine Catholics. There are, there are Eastern Rite Catholics just like they're Western Rite Orthodox. So ask them who Yeah. There you go. There you go. Anyway, go ahead. I forgot. 
All right, so the next time, why you have a different Bible or why we have a different Bible. Thank you. Thank you.